I'm Ben Drum. I'm a scientist at the University of Nevada, Reno Department of Physiology. I'm a physiologist from the Republic of Ireland. Israel is a botanist from Nigeria. Jason is an earth scientist, a geologist from Nevada. We are very different people. We come from very different backgrounds. We study very different things. But one thing that unites us all together is science itself, the scientific method, and how we use it to discern answers from very hard problems. So Israel has told us all about Charles Darwin himself. What I would like to talk about now is why we're all here in a room giving up our Sunday afternoon to hear about the guy. So of course I'm talking about the theory of evolution itself. And the theory of evolution tells us some pretty wacky things if you actually sit down for a moment and think about it. So the theory of evolution tells us that all life on Earth is connected. If you've ever seen any living thing anywhere, you're related to it somehow. You know, our great 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 grandfathers were a common ancestor with modern day chimps. So chimps that we see in the wild today are actually our distant cousins. Go back even further, our distant cousins are also fishes. They're also little rats. If you go back far enough, we're actually related on a family tree to oranges, bananas, and apples and pears. You know, that's a pretty ludicrous thing to say, if you actually think about it. But there's a very good reason why we accept that as a fact in uh, 2016. And what I'm going to talk about is some of the evidences that we have for evolution, and why we think that it is a fact today. Does anybody here think that evolution is true, by the way? A few hands, so I'm kind of preaching to the converted, aren't I? But it's important to know why we think it's true. The worst thing is to just think that something like evolution is true just because somebody tells you. It's important to use the scientific method to look at the various evidences that we have and come to your own conclusion. And I would kind of preempt to this by saying that the evidence for evolution is incredibly strong. So using the scientific method, it's the only conclusion that we're left with. But before I get into any specifics about evolution, I want to talk about science in general, just so everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. So as I said, there's a couple of scientists in the room. We all study different things, but we all kind of come at them at the same way. So we do this using the scientific method, and we can use this to investigate the natural world. So observable effects, observable phenomenon, we can use science to work these things out and find out how they work. And scientific knowledge, by definition, is derived from that method. So using the scientific method, we garner information about the world around us, and we call that scientific knowledge. So this is a schematic which some of you may be very intimately familiar with. So this is a rough diagram of how science in general works. So at the very top here, we have observations. So we observe a particular phenomenon in nature or in the laboratory, and we wonder, well, how is that working? So we form a hypothesis on how it works. Well, maybe it's working this way, or maybe it's working that way. And in order to test if that hypothesis are true or not, we come up with a couple of ideas of predictions we can make. So for example, if one of these chairs had wet paint on it, but you weren't sure, you'd say, well, I have a hypothesis that the paint on that chair is wet, but I don't know for sure. How would you test that? You can make a prediction about it. Well, if I touch it and some paint comes off my finger, that would show that it's wet. So in science, we do things like that. We make predictions. If our hypothesis is true, then X will happen if we test Y or so on. So we do this testing with various experiments. And we repeat these experiments to make sure that they're right. And then if the hypothesis holds up, it's valid or viable. And we can repeat this many times. But if it's rejected, we go back to the drawing board. If our predictions don't work out, we don't get the data that supports the hypothesis. It's thrown out or it's modified in some way. But there's also a crucial final element, which is, for professional scientists is critical, the peer review process. So when we do these uh, experiments, when we make these predictions, we write them up. So a scientist, as well as being an actual experimenter and researcher, also becomes an author. So a scientist will write up their experimental data, write it up, and submit it to a scientific journal. And when that gets submitted, a variety of different experts in that field will analyze the experiments, see if they were done properly, critically analyze them, and see if the data is valid. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes flaws come out. And that's why peer review is so important, because it weeds out bad science. It's a very necessary filter to weed out bad scientific data. And if it stands up to peer review, it will get published in the journal that it gets submitted to. But the peer review process doesn't stop there, because once it's submitted and it's published, other scientists can then go on and read it, and repeat it for themselves. And that way, peer review happens all the time. It's a continuous cyclic process. So 
I, this really can't be emphasized enough that the scientific method is based on testable predictions. And I'm going to bring this round to evolution by showing some testable, simple predictions that people have made about evolution and how they've tested that data and see if it stands up or not. And another thing I'll talk about with evolution is how falsifiable it is. Because a prediction is no good if it can't be falsified. Let's go back to the example of the wet paint on the chair. Let's say you wipe your finger on it and nothing comes off. You'd say, oh well, it's not wet. But what if somebody said, oh well, it is wet, but there's something wrong with your finger. Go, okay, well, what's wrong with my finger? And okay, so what could be wrong with your finger? If somebody can give an excuse for every time an experiment comes up, well, it's not true because of X, Y, Z, then it's a non-falsifiable experiment and it's essentially no good. Your experiment has to be falsifiable in order to be testable. And something that uh, we sometimes hear a lot uh, with evolution and things, it's just a theory. And I want to just spend a moment talking about this. So the other day, I couldn't find my car keys. And I was walking around my house and my wife said to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for my keys. And I said, I have a couple of theories about where they are. And I said, well, maybe they're in the kitchen. Now, that's something we use every day, right? That's every day. Of I have a theory of where something is or I've lost something or whatever. But in the scientific world, we use the word theory in a very special, specific way. That's very different to the way we use it in vernacular or everyday language. So when we say just a theory, we're actually talking about a hypothesis, which is an observation for which we have zero evidence for or explanation. A scientific theory is radically different. So a scientific theory, as opposed to a theory you talk about every day, it's a statement that explains a huge amount of data that's repeatable, that's been tested, and makes a lot of predictions. Just like we're talking about if X is true, then we'll find Y, and so on. So what is evolution? Evolution is a scientific theory, but let's pretend for a moment that it's just a hypothesis we're testing. So, what is evolution? Now, Israel has gone through a little bit of this already, but from my money on the simplest terms, if I wanted to put it in a sentence, evolution is this. It's the gradual change of a biological organism's inherited characteristics over successive generations. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but inherited characteristics I want to point out, what I'm talking about there are our genes our genetic information that's encoded in our genes. So when I use the word characteristics, that's interchangeable with genes. So I, the good way to point this out is just to think about all the different kind of dogs that we have. How many people in the room have dogs? Right. There's a lot of you, and you probably have different ones, right? So a lot of dogs are made through artificial selection or artificial breeding, right? And it's something we're kind of familiar with. We can test the idea that successive <coughs> genes bring about change in dogs. For example, if you want a dog with droopier ears or a different colour coat, you select the dogs that, well, that guy's got droopy ears and so does she, so we'll breed these together. And, and over successive generations, the ears get droopier and droopier and droopier until eventually you can get different subspecies of dogs. And this tests the idea that a selection process can bring change. You're choosing which dogs, which genes, which characteristics you want to go on to the next generation, and over time the animal itself will change. Now, obviously, in the natural world, animals and different species don't have a selector doing this for them. They don't have an external agent, well, I want this, I want this, I want this. Instead, it's a natural process, and that's where the term natural selection actually comes from. Because instead of an artificial breeder, we have a natural breeder or a natural selector. And this is what changes genes over successive generations. So, it allows genes that are beneficial to the organism <coughs> to survive for longer perhaps, or produce, or reproduce, which is the essential element, because if the animal doesn't reproduce, the genes don't get passed on, so those genes don't survive. So anything that helps an animal reproduce its genes will be favored over something that doesn't, because if you think about it for a moment, if it doesn't help the animal have children, where do the genes go? They stop, because there's no next generation to carry them on. And that's why reproduction is so essential to the idea of natural selection and evolution in general. So, I just want to sum this up, that natural selection, you need a variety in a gene pool. So we've all got different genes, right? We get half our genes from our mother and another half from our father, so there's a variety of different genes in there. And the genes must be regulatory, and that's something we're familiar with. We all kind of look a little bit like our parents, a bit less like our cousins, a bit less like our second cousins. So the more closely related we are to people, the more our genes are being inherited by them. 
and some genes lead to more reproduction than others. And if you think about it, again, that's a little bit intuitive, isn't it? Isn't it? So think about this in the natural world. If you have uh, animals and they have different mating calls, for example, if a bird has genes that favor a, a better mating call, for example, those genes get favored and passed on to the next generation because those animals will be favored to reproduce for others that don't. So with this in mind, we can have the idea that these different genes and variants are selected naturally from the gene pool to be passed on to the next generation. And over time, this can lead to brand new species. And this is a process that we call speciation. And in speciation, what happens is that there's a species that has a population of organisms within it that are capable of sharing genetic information or just reproducing. And they can create fertile offspring, which leads to new species. Now, sometimes in nature, you can have different species that get isolated from each other. And that's genetic isolation is what I'm talking about. Even if the animals live right beside each other, for some reason, they don't interbreed. They're not sharing genetic information anymore. And over time, that can lead to enough change where that becomes a serious issue. So they go under different selection pressures, for example. I just think of the idea of a good example is ants. If you have ants in a large room this size, the environment for an ant is very different if they're on this table than if they're over there. You know, there's very different selection pressures going on in different populations. And in this way, different genes get favored for every generation. And then over time, these once identical species, even if they're exactly the same at one point, once they become isolated from each other, they can lead to speciation and new species. And this is what actually gives rise to biodiversity. So, if I wanted to sum up evolution in a sentence with everything I'm talking about so far, I'd simply say that it's changes in inherited characteristics over time, driven by random genetic mutations and the non-random power of natural selection. And I think this is a very important point, and I'd like to emphasize it. Could I ask two people to come up here to help me demonstrate something? You just have to hold something for me. Just any two people, Anya and Jen. So, evolution is random. In a way, but in another way, it's anything but random. And this is how I want to kind of demonstrate this. So, here's a box of genes. So, we have Kit Kats, Twixes, M&Ms, some Snickers, and a few other goodies. Jen, you hold that, please. So, this is a random set of genes in a gene pool. I want to hold this. We want to evolve this box of mixed <coughs> genes using random mutations into a population of pure Kit Kat genes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a random mutation. I'm just going to randomly take one of these and just put it in there and not go look. So I'm a random mutation and I'm just going to grab a couple of these and see what happens and hopefully something will happen. Okay, so it's a mixed bag. So random mutations on their own don't give us real evolution as we understand it. So now with the exact same process, if I randomly mutate, if I randomly put my arm in, but I select what I throw in on his box. Okay, that's not my one. Then I go, oh, it's like that. It's a Kit Kat. Again, that's not what I want, and so on. You can see how very quickly, even with random mutations, you can end up evolving into something completely different to what you start out with. So in this way, it's random mutations, but with the non-random power of natural selection is what drives evolution. So thank you very much. Please dispense the candy. <laughs> so, I know what you're all thinking that this all sounds very cool, and I'm, because it is, but what about the evidence? As I said, you shouldn't just accept evolution because somebody tells you that it's true. You should look at the evidence, make predictions about it, and see if those predictions hold up. So, there's a couple of predictions that are very simple, and some of the experts in evolution in the room know far more about this than me, people like Israel, so I'll have a good chat with him. I'm going to give some very simple examples of predictions we make about evolution, and let's see if they hold up. So we're talking about predictions that are specific, flexible, and repeatable, and I'll show you how in each one it could be falsified. So let's start with something that we're all a little bit familiar with, perhaps the fossil record, which is used for evolution quite a lot. So if the theory, or let's say the hypothesis of evolution is valid, we predict that in the fossil record we should see patterns of simple fossils changing into more complex over time. So when we uh, actually go look at this in intact rock strata, and again, this is a very simple diagram, but what we're showing here is fossil layers in different rock strata. And as you can see, as you go deeper or older, it's very simple. 
But then as you go younger, as you move up through the layers, the fossils become more and more complex. Now, it would be very easy for this not to be the case, right? Imagine if all of this were jumbled up. The, the complex guys were mixed down here, the deeper layers, this prediction wouldn't hold up. But when we look at intact rock strata, this is what we find. So in this case, what we're predicting, if the hypothesis of evolution is true, stands up pretty well. Another thing we can look into with the fossil record is that fossils should be more similar to fossils in adjacent layers. There shouldn't be dramatic jumps if the fossil record is intact. And again, that's what we find. When we make these predictions and we look at the fossils in adjacent layers, and let's look at these guys, these are more similar to here and here, right? Again, just like the previous example, it would be very easy for this not to be the case. But when we look at the fossils in intact layers, this is exactly what we find. Also, we should predict that at certain time points in the fossil record, certain animal groups would appear at a certain time. Because evolution tells us that animals as they exist today haven't always been around, because they've been descended from other animal groups and different species. So let's say, for example, mammals weren't around at the beginning of life on Earth. So they should appear at a certain point in the fossil record and not before. And when we look, that's exactly what we find. So here are the very first appearance of mammals in the Triassic period about 250 million years ago. And they're obviously very different to the mammals we have today. So all the time of life on Earth, there were no mammals before. And that goes for every single animal group. And again, that would be very easy if for this not to be the case, right? So imagine if we had a modern, modern day animal in the wrong place. Just as an example here is the Cambrian period, which Jason talked about this morning. So the Cambrian period was a time about five to six hundred million years ago when all life on Earth was very simple, mostly unicellular, but some multicellular stuff going on with the first fishes and so on, and all life was in the sea. There were no modern mammals, no modern reptiles. So we could prove this prediction to be false if, for example, we found a rabbit living in the Cambrian layer of the fossil record. But to date, this hasn't been found. But it's still technically possible, but to date, despite a lot of hard looking, this has never been found. So, so far, our predictions of evolution are holding up pretty well. And now, with uh, a term that I despise, <laughs> the, the transitional fossil, it's an important thing to talk about. What Jason told us this morning is that evolution takes an extremely long time to happen and we know that because the age of the earth is so long and we can see it in the fossil record. A good way to explain this is, imagine you took a photo, like a portrait of your face, every day of your life. The day you were born up until you were 80 or 90 years old. And you put them side by side. And then look at them in sequence. Every picture of yourself is going to look exactly the same as the day before and the day after, isn't it? If you look yourself in the mirror, this morning, and you didn't look different than yesterday, and you won't look different tomorrow. But if you look at a two-year-old compared to a nine-year-old, that's very different. Could you point to the photo where that transition happened? The one photo, and say, that's it, that's the one. I don't think you could. And that's the, what we do in the fossil record. We're trying to find a transitional fossil when all fossils are transitional. But there are actually a really cool couple of examples that people have found that illustrate this point pretty well, where we see different animals emerging from different animal groups which share traits with other species. A very famous uh, example is Tiktaalik, an example of one of the first land-walking fish type creatures. So Tiktaalik had gills, scales of fish, indicative of fish, but he had tetrapod rib bones and lungs and probably walked on land, just like a modern mudfish would. Another good example is Archaeopteryx, the first example, perhaps, that we know of of a transitional fossil between reptiles and modern birds. So he had jaws, fingers with claws, bony tails, but he had feathers. By the way, speaking of dinosaurs again today, we now know that a lot of dinosaurs were actually feathered. So when you, next time you watch Jurassic Park, remember that the T-Rex actually probably looked like a giant chicken with all these feathers, rather than the big monstrosity that Steven Spielberg gave us. Where uh, theory of evolution really comes into its own, I think, is in molecular biology and when we look at the genetic code. Because again, evolution teaches us that we're all connected, we're all descended from different ancestors together. So, if we look at the theory of evolution, we should predict that we have a similar genetic code. Our genes are what we all share that encode what we are and how we function. So we should see a family tree of descent based on molecular biology because based on our genomes, we can measure how related we are to other animals, based on how similar they are. And when we do that, 
We find that it forms a family tree that looks a little bit like this. So I don't have a picture here, but here's us right up here. And you can see on the left are uh, simian cousins, modern day chimps and bonobos. And we are just a twig on the evolutionary tree of life, really. But what, at least for me, I find this a pretty amazing thing to look at because this tells us that we are literally connected to every single thing that has ever lived and will ever live on this planet. That's a pretty amazing thing. So we're up here and we are on the branch of vertebrates, which came from the original form of life, of course. And what's really cool about this, that this also shows, using molecular biology, that we're all connected, okay, so that prediction comes true. But if you look at the fossil record, and you compare it when these different animal groups emerge and you, using Jason's methods, if you calculate the age of those fossils compare it to the molecular <coughs> biology it all fits together in a perfect overlap so we're seeing convergent disciplines coming to the exact same conclusion about our origins which is a pretty strong scientific uh, way of saying that evolution is true but we can go even further, we can look at embryology when we're in our womb, when we're in our mother's womb, what do we look like? We could predict that if we looked the same as some of our older ancestors, this would kind of assume some evolutionary relationship. And when we go and look, that's exactly what we find yet again. So if we look at the embryo of a fish and compare it to a human, or a reptile or a bird, you'd be hard pressed to almost tell them apart, wouldn't you? And when we actually look at the development of a human in the womb, it actually goes through the evolutionary stages of all our ancestors. First, we look like a single cell. Then we look like a fish, then we look like a reptile, then we look like an amphibian, then we look like a bird, then we look like a chimpanzee, until eventually we look a, like a human. And we also have some of our vestigial structures in the embryo. Did you know that humans have gills in the womb? We all had gills at one point. These are called parenteal pouches. So in fish, when they come out, these are left intact, these form gills they use for breathing. For us, this has evolved to the point where these actually become our circulatory system. But, when they first form in the womb, they're, they're gills, just like fish. So that's very strong evidence that we come from common ancestors. And this is a really nice example of the predictive power of evolution. I'm talking about the distribution of animals. So, is anybody here from Australia? Nobody? Okay. Hmm? You wish? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if you did live in Australia, if you've ever been, you'll know that marsupials are the only animals that are found in Australia and nowhere else, really. So, in Australia, we find marsupials, although the North American opossums are notable exception. And that's a very curious thing to think about. How, how did that happen? Why are marsupials only in Australia and nowhere else? And there's another point to this as well. The oldest marsupial fossils that we know of are actually in Patagonia in South America. So how in the world does that make sense? If the oldest marsupial fossils are found here, but they're only found here today. So what geologists and evolutionary scientists predicted about 50 or 60 years ago is that, as Jason pointed out, millions of years ago, about 160 million years ago, the land masses of the Earth were more joined than they are today. So a prediction was made that, well, we predict that these fossil remnants of marsupials are actually the evolutionary ancestors of marsupials in Australia. A prediction was made that these ancient marsupials migrated across modern Antarctica when it was joined to Patagonia. And the, the survivors lived in Australia when the continent detached. Those are evolved ancestors of the Patagonian marsupials. And they predicted that, well, if we go to modern day Antarctica, we should find marsupial fossils in a certain rock layer of a certain age if this prediction is true. And when they went, they actually went to Antarctica, did the expedition found marsupial fossils in the right rock layer of the right age. And they were in a transitionary period from the modern marsupials we have in Australia to the ancient ones we have in southern Patagonia. So again, very strong predictive power of the evolutionary hypothesis. And I've already talked a little bit about vestigial organs, so anybody in this room have their appendix taken out? Richard and a few others? Okay. So vestigial organs, an appendix is an example of that, something that we no longer need. Or, to put it more correctly, we no longer need it for the function that it originally evolved for. And there are just some really cool examples of this. So, our tailbone is one from our simian ancestors, right? Probably something we're all familiar with. You ever notice that little weird thing in the corner of your eye? Kind of itches a lot? It gathers sleep when you wake up? That's actually called a nicotinic membrane. Anybody ever see a crocodile blink? Its eye kind of goes like that? That's what that is in your eye. 
We have a vestigial remnant of a nictitating membrane from our reptilian ancestors to protect our eyes when they were underwater. And not only that, things like this mole rat here has vestigial eyes. It lives mo the most of its life in the dark. It no longer needs its eyes. And of course, the famous example of whales having hip bones, not very good when you live 6,000 feet underwater. So. <laughs> And speaking of vestigial things, this goes all the way back down to molecular biology, of course. So we have genes that we no longer need. Birds have genes for teeth. Modern birds only have beaks. Why on earth do they have genes for teeth? Because they inherited them from their ancestors. They no longer need them. But uh, there's a couple of over equal examples here. Humans and primate, primates don't have a functional gene for making vitamin C. That's why we need to eat oranges or we get scurvy. Because um, there's a single DNA mutation in the vitamin C production gene in humans and primates only. So why do we have this gene if it's not functional? And probably the best example I know of, humans have dead genes for making egg yolk. Again, another vestigial remnant of our reptilian ancestors. So why would an animal that develops in a womb have all the capability and structures for making eggs? It's something we've inherited evolutionary from our ancestors. <coughs> And I hope that I have stressed the point in each of these examples that disproving evolution would actually be very, very easy if uh, it wasn't true. With each of these experiments, each of these predictions, I've tried to point out, well, if we found this, for example, in the genetic code, if we found that each animal had a very different genetic code, that it wasn't shared, the theory of evolution would be gone straight away. If we found different things in the fossil record which didn't corroborate what we find in molecular biology, evolution would disproved. If every animal had genes only for what it did, and nothing that its ancient ancestors did, evolution would be at the door too. But to date, despite a lot of hard trying, despite a million chances to be wrong, the theory of evolution has held up on all of its predictions when it's done with rigorous scientific uh, data and experimentation. And as uh, some people have already pointed out today, this isn't really kind of controversial in the scientific community. Uh, to, if you adhere to the scientific method, there really can be no reasonable doubt that the theory of evolution is a valid explanation of how humans have evolved from our ancestors and why chimps are our closest cousins and oranges, apples, bananas and pears are our very extreme distant cousins we only see once a year in Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, does evolution fit the criteria for a good scientific hypothesis and is it worthy of being a valid scientific theory like the theory that the earth revolves around the sun the theory of gravity or germ theory, I would posit that yes, it absolutely is. And I hope that after this talk, a lot of you will agree with me. So, uh, I don't think I have a huge amount of time for questions. Maybe one or two quick ones if anybody has them. But otherwise, I'll uh, talk at lunch. But, yeah, go on ahead. Uh, you talked about the that reminded me of uh, the experiment with the Siberian fox domestication. Yeah. Yeah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but in that experiment they had wild Siberian foxes yes. and, and over a couple of generations, picking the most docile ones, they were able to essentially turn these wild ravenous predators into pets. Two generations. Yeah. Two generations. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Shows the power of selecting different traits and genes for what you want. Yeah, you were actually, from what I've been told, and I didn't get very deep into the experiment, they were trying to get them. trying to, for example, to get droopy ears or a different coat, you find that a lot of these things are co-functional with more behavioral aspects of the dog as well, so I think that's pretty interesting, so that's a good point. Yes? Is there such a thing as knowing the ideas are disproved evolution is that there's no missing link between man and the apes? Yeah. Is that, I mean, is that really valuable? Is there just such a thing as a missing link or a common ancestor? Uh, well, do, Humans do have a common ancestor with modern-day chimps, 
uh, that we evolved from, uh, I can't remember the exact time, but uh, millions of years ago. The idea of a missing link is a bit of a misnomer because what kind of a missing link? Uh, I often use this example. How many people in here believe that the Earth revolves around the sun? There's a few down hands I would have talked to. You. <laughs> Now, with the people who held your hands up, how many people have stared at the sun unblinking for every second of 365 days a year? Not many. So, we don't need absolute knowledge to discern a very discernible pattern. No one's ever done that experiment with the sun, but we can say, well, we can make a prediction. If the Earth revolves around the sun, if we observe the Earth's orbit, it shall be in a certain place at a certain time. And you can do that many times and work out a pattern, so you can be very sure of something. And that's what we do in evolution. We don't have a complete fossil record, but what we do have is an absolute pattern in the fossil record of our simian ancestors. The only way we would have that absolute knowledge is if we had every single individual fossilized. But we can do this in molecular biology as well, because with molecular biology we can actually measure using our genomes how closely related we are to other animals. And that's pretty much a continuum. And again, this idea of the missing link, if you go back to my analogy of the photographs, where would you stop if you talk, okay, that's the missing link, but why not the next one, if the next one is so similar and so on, where, where does it stop, it's a bit ridiculous. So it's a bit of an upside down way of thinking about it, but uh, I would say that there's no controversy about a missing link at all. And, okay. I'm just going to add one thing Species, if a, if a species that was born today could breed with a species that was born a thousand years ago, that's one species. If you move that scale one generation further, all of a sudden the species that was born at 1,001 years cannot no longer breed with the species from 1,001. They are now no longer a portion of the same species. The likelihood of them breeding together is very unlikely. Okay, that's that, that's the progression of things. You can take this slice and move it anywhere along that line, and the same thing applies. Certain certain species can only mate with other species from the past up to a certain point, and that all changes over time. It depends on what something could happen to make a shift in the species. It could happen quicker, or it could happen slower. In other words, an alligator today might be able to breed with an alligator from, help me out, 25, 30, 40,000 years ago. Okay? But a finch, a finch today could breed with the finch that was uh, on the Galapagos Islands, for instance, that was around 600 years ago. They changed enough that they can no longer breed together. So speciation isn't about one single type of animal. It's a constant change of thing. And uh, we don't have a huge amount of time now because I want people to be able to get up, get some sandwiches, get some cake. We have a Darwin themed birthday cake, everybody. So please help yourself to that. Grab some water, grab some sodas. And we'll be back here at 3 o'clock for our next speakers. Thank you so much.